I'm waiting, waiting until the ad. Uh, oh, Jason, you are live. Oh, I am. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. I am Jason Merrill with Blackbird Finery, and I'm going to talk about cufflinks and how to uh, uh, identify them in the wild, uh, cufflinks and other accessories uh, for the next hour. Um, I hope I can get through everything in time. I kept running across more things I wanted to talk about as I was putting the uh, slide deck together. So uh, let's just go ahead and jump in. So let me make sure I'm, there we go. So basically this is what I just told you. How to, basically when I first started doing this, I ran across a bunch of sellers that were selling shirt studs as cufflinks. And that really kind of annoyed me because they had no idea what it was they were selling, yet they were claiming to be experts. So um, I started doing enough digging and I collected enough samples. So this is a kind of a view of my collection in addition to uh, showing you what's what. Now, the very basic style of cufflink is the modern toggle. And that looks kind of like this. These are a nice set of mid-century uh, regular cufflinks. You can see the toggle there. Um, it pivots and kind of fits inside that, that shaft, and you just poke it through your cuffs. And there, this is what you will find the most of. These are the most modern uh, style. I say modern, but it's um, they've been in use since the 20s, 30s. I'd have to go and look and see what the earliest patent on that type of uh, swivel is, but that's what you see most of. And so they actually snap together, come apart. And that's actually a brand name. Swank has a line of these snap links called Come Apart. And this is how they look when they are on a cuff. You get the same uh, nice uh, art basically on each side of the wrist, but on the inside of the cuff, they just snap together. So if you want to roll your sleeves up, you can unsnap, roll your sleeves. You don't have to worry about, hey, where did I put those cufflinks? Are they in my pocket? Um, it just makes sense to do it. Uh, it just I, I just like the cufflinks. I mean, the snap links. And the, um, the majority of them were, say, 20s, 30s. So some really great Art Deco designs. Um, I really should have gotten more examples other than this, but um, let me make sure I'm right window. There we go. So here's some ads from uh, the Come Apart line. Uh, the one on the left, uh, the colored one, is from a uh, Motion Picture Weekly from uh, I want to say it was 24 might even be earlier than that and then the other one's a saturday evening post and i can't remember the year on that but they show you exactly how they're supposed to work but that gives you that the brand name and uh other brands exist but the majority of the ones i've run across have been the swank come aparts so the next style is just a classic link and so these are some Victorian cufflinks. Uh, might be hard to see, but on the left, um, they're monogrammed. One is a G and one is an M. I have no idea if it's supposed to be G and M or M and G, but they're a matching set. The inside of the wrist would be the plain side. The monogram would be on the outside. And then as you can see, 
it's just a very simple metal link that holds the two pieces together. And there are more modern styles like this that have that same sort of, it's like a single link in a chain. And I prefer the double-sided cuff links because you've got a little piece of art on both sides of the wrist. And that, um, I, I just really like that as opposed to say it just a toggle or something simple on the inside. Uh, it just shows you go that extra mile. So one of the earlier styles is the bean style uh, because the inner piece is a solid bean shape and it doesn't move it doesn't pivot you just slide it through the buttonholes um this is a, a unique set that i found that's all still together in the box so i don't think these had ever been worn and it's actually the cufflinks a tie clip and a tie pin or ascot pin uh, basically a stick pin that you could wear wherever you wanted to wear it you could wear it in your lapel you could wear it in your tie um but finding a matching set like this is really really uh unique i was very surprised when i ran across it i've got another set that's close to this but it's missing one of the cufflinks and there's nothing more frustrating than finding an almost complete set because the odds of finding the, the missing piece are astronomical. So uh, another more modern style is the wrap style. And that's where you have a little mesh uh, piece that wraps around the outer edge of the cuff. On the left side, you see uh, left hand. You see one extended, and basically there's a loop at the end that fits over the toggle. So once you've slid the toggle through your cuff, you slide the uh, the whole of you uh, pivot it, and it stays in place. And these add that little extra bit of bling to your wrist. Um, I've seen some. Some of the more gaudier cufflinks that I've seen come with these wraps on them. Now, some are uh, permanently attached to the cufflink, others are separate. And so you can get gold tone and silver tone wraps you can add to uh, any toggle pair of cufflinks that you already have. And I've gotten some that, that have shown up just by themselves. But they really do, they look good on because, yes, you're wearing cufflinks, but not everybody else that's wearing cufflinks is going to have that wrap. The next is, is one I've, I've only recently ran across, and basically it's a screw type where the ends, or at least one end, unscrews, and you can fit it, fit the post through the, uh, a cuff rather easily and then you can screw the other piece on this particular pair it's actually uh small enough that you can put it through the buttonholes without having to unscrew it but uh the fact that uh you can is it's intriguing but i really i don't like the um the actual threaded screw being there and being seen it's just not, I don't think it's, um, it's classy. So uh, next we have the barbell style. And these are a, a solid piece of cufflink. So you've got a larger end and a smaller end. And they don't move, they don't turn, they don't pivot. It's kind of an all-in-one. And you just slide the smaller end through the uh, buttonholes. And then that stays on the inside of the wrist. So you do have a bit of art on both sides. Just one larger, one smaller. And that shows what, I, what the uh, red one looks like 
in a cuff. Um, I was surprised that in the same lot were the um, the colored ones. The uh, white are a mother of pearl, and those are much uh, much earlier. Those are either Victorian or Edwardian. The other three are, are a lot more modern. Could be 80s, 90s, even newer. Um, it's often hard to tell. Other than uh, construction quality, um, overall condition. Um, a lot of times you're just having a guess, but sometimes you actually can either uh, find a magazine ad that actually shows the item. So you can date things that way uh, via magazine or newspaper ads. Or if there's, um, you know, there's a company name probably on the inside of the cufflink somewhere. Companies sometimes change their uh, their logos or their marks. So if you can determine when they used that particular mark, that'll at least give you a time frame of a decade or more. But you know they stopped using it at a particular time. Let's see what I have next. Uh, a chain style. So it's like the the link, but it's a longer chain. And these uh, Murano cufflinks are a lot, a lot more modern. Um, I was kind of surprised when they showed up in a lot, but that's actually several links in a chain. Uh, the the cuff images show you, you know, how it looks on the outside, but that's how it looks on the inside. And it's it gives you a little more uh, breathing room at the wrist because they're not right next to each other. The uh, other two are also more modern studs. Those have more of a single link, but it's still much more chain-like than the ones we saw earlier. The, um, the uh, logo on the ones on the right, it says the Vogue. So I've had trouble trying to find information on the Vogue because I keep getting, oh, a certain magazine that pops up. That's the other interesting thing about trying to do the research is terms that they used in a particular time frame have become completely generic or now refer to something else entirely, which makes doing just a general Google search uh, somewhat frustrating. So this is one of the cooler ones uh, that I've run across. It's a chain, but it's a retractable chain. They roll up into either side. So they, they move with your, your wrist. If you've got a really large wrist, you can, um, uh, you can wear these with ease and not have to worry about it being too tight across your wrist. Um, but they you know, retract fully. So you may not even realize that they're there, but the, the, um, that length of chain makes it really easy to uh, get on and off because you've got a little more, um, uh, once again, breathing room to play with as you're putting in the uh, cuff length. And I, I had had a set of these that I wanted to keep around as an example, and somebody bought them off me like that. And I was really lucky to find these basically new in box. I think there was a little, probably a clear plastic acrylic cover that went over them that's missing, but it still has the outer box. So um, a few other miscellaneous things here. The silk knots are the one on the left, and those are just silk uh, covered elastic. And more often than not, you will get these with a shirt. If you buy a, a French cuff shirt these days, sometimes they'll include a pair of the French knots. Part of that is so it's obvious when you're buying the shirt that that is a French cuff because it's got a cuff link there and not a button. Um, I know people that will take uh, one silk knot 
and they will wear it in their jacket lapel because it just fits right there in a buttonhole and doesn't go anywhere. And um, because they're elasticated, they're, um, they're easy to get in and out. Um, it's okay if you lose them because they're uh, pretty easy to find. Um, normally, I had seen just the, the literal knot style. But when I ran across the, uh, both the square and the, the cylinder, uh, I had to get those because that gives you, once again, something a little more uh, unique on the outside of the wrist that'll, you know, catch the eye and uh, catch someone's attention. Now on the right, um, the uh, green and then the kind of uh, orangish, those were both unique styles of uh, toggles that I had never really seen before. But the one I had never seen at all were the leather ones. And apparently that's the, um, I guess, town uh, sigil logo for a, uh, a, a skiing town in the Swiss Alps. And those, I guess, are sold as, as uh, souvenirs, merchandise from the town. But what's unique is they are entirely leather. So if you're flying or you're going in and out of, say, a courtroom, where they have metal detectors, if you wear these, you don't have to take them out. The other pair that um, can stay in, like, like the leather ones, uh, I occasionally get in some mother of pearl. And it's, it's all solid mother of pearl. It's, um, it's actually two pieces. The, uh, the outer piece is one, and it's attached to the inner piece that has like a little bean on the end, but there's no metal whatsoever. So if you're flying a lot, they can stay in and you don't have to worry about taking them out, loot possibly losing them. But um, once again, some, some really unique pieces. Now, what's interesting about the these uh, stone ones on the left there's very, very, very faint writing on the inside of that toggle. And I was finally able to get like a clear enough picture that I could blow up so I could see what it said. Nope. It's pat app for, meaning that the patent has been applied for. So unless I can go digging through the patent database and find who tried to patent this style, I won't know the company because there's no company name on them anywhere unless I run across like an ad. Now, the green pair, um, it had a full patent number on it. And if you just Google patent 1950711, you find the actual patent document that was uh, assigned to Dolan and Bullock. And uh, back to what I said about dating, they received the patent in 1934. It entered uh, public domain, basically, in 1951. So sometime between those two dates, uh, Dolan and Bullock made this particular pair of cufflinks. Because once it was in the public domain, there was no need to put the patent on it. So um, I spelled that out here just because you never know what you're going to run across and you never know what might lead you down uh, the path to finding more information and actually being able to date the uh, item in your hand. So now we're going to shift from the cufflinks to the uh, shirt and collar studs because these are a lot of things that you will find being sold as cufflinks but are not cufflinks because we've just gone through what cufflinks look like. So the ones that most often get confused for cufflinks are your uh, pipe stem sliding pen style. And as you can see, there's a long piece at the back of the stud. 
and it actually slides back and forth so you can shorten it on one end to slide it into the shirt and then let it expand back out and that way it's tight in the shirt and it's not going anywhere particularly if you angle it against you know your normal buttonholes or vertical if once the stud is in you turn it horizontal it's probably not going to be going anywhere now these were really meant for your stiffer shirt fronts that required studs they were too stiff to use buttons and some of these were a completely separate shirt front that it, that attached kind of like a dickie others it's the shirt itself and they actually make launderable stiff front shirts now instead of having to completely send it out to be dry cleaned every time um they still require the studs now these days if you buy a tuxedo shirt more often than not there will be a little strip on the inside that has buttons that is buttoned in place so you can use those buttons or you can take that strip out unbutton it off the back and then use studs to to close the shirt older sets you will find uh when you get like a full set you'll have your cufflinks your shirt studs and waistcoat studs your waistcoat was closed the exact same way now these are normally the scoop front so there's only three or four buttons required at the bottom of the waistcoat and you'll have four and three sets of studs in with that full collection and i've got one or two in i didn't really get pictures of them but um it's amazing when you find still in the box a full set that has all of the shirt studs and all of the waistcoat studs because if you have a collection of anything you're gonna lose one that's one of the reasons why a lot of these show up being sold as cufflinks if you notice here there's three studs for the three buttonholes on the shirt that, that are visible if you lose one there's only two left people who don't know what these are think they're cufflinks so sell some cufflinks or buy them for someone remember that these aren't <laughs> these are shirt studs now these are some of my favorite pipe stem style um the victorian glass uh globes on the left and i actually have a red set but one of the glass pieces fell out and i need to have it repaired before i wear it again but it's very very festive now i cannot believe the green set on the right i mean yes it's all glass but it's amazing because that's two cufflinks with the really big piece on the outside a smaller little bit of bling on the inside of the wrist and then two pipe stem shirt studs to match the cufflinks and if you're wearing the right type of waistcoat all they're going to see is either one or two of those studs I just haven't had the right occasion to wear them yet. Now the uh, green glass ones, I have worn. This was at uh, Dragon Con uh, a couple of years ago. I do a uh, formal ballroom dance for the alt history track. And um, I knew I had to uh, pull these out and wear them with the uh, green velvet dinner jacket. And that's one of my favorite dinner jackets anyway i think that's just a great sharp combination so the next type of shirt stud is oh wait you, this is another set and i just had to show these because i love the brilliant green on these 
for whatever reason, I get a ton of greens in, not as many of the other colors, but uh, a complete set here in fantastic shape. Um, I've not worn these yet, but you better believe I'm going to find an occasion to wear. So now you've got your more modern shirt studs. And these are just basically have a plain back, a plain piece. This is what comes when you rent a tuxedo today. Um, you can find them all over the place. Often when you buy a, uh, a tuxedo shirt, they'll have plastic versions of these uh, holding the shirt together, uh, showing you that this is where your, your actual real metal studs would go. And they come in all different uh, color tones. You've got your silver, you've got your gold tone, you've got all different types of stones. You've got uh, onyx, you've got mother of pearl, um, you've got pearl uh, studs themselves. Um, it's just, you know, you have this fascinating array. And then these, uh, these on the far right, that's a pair of barbell cufflinks and three matching shirt studs. And they're much shorter than the modern studs, but it's basically the same thing. You just slide the back through the buttonhole and uh, it keeps your shirt closed. Let's see. Okay, so you have your collar studs. Now these look like the shirt studs and can also be worn as studs to hold your shirt closed. But they're specifically meant for your collar. Now, there's two different styles, one for the front and one for the back. Now, what's interesting here is the uh, top two that I tipped over, those are from Swank, and they're actually labeled two for 25. So a quarter would get you two shirt studs. And people were losing them all the time. I should have gotten a picture of it. I've got a little leather box. That, that's meant for to hold just your, your studs. And it says uh, two in the box are worth one under the bed. And I think that's great. So these are the front studs. They are longer. And they're worn. Uh, the reason why they're longer is they have two layers of shirt to go through. And then two layers of very stiff collar. Now, this is just a plain imperial collar, so it's just straight up. Now, the back piece, because all it's doing is holding one layer of shirt and one layer of collar. And I've, I've got one of the longer front studs up against the shorter studs to show you the difference. More often, the shorter studs have a flatter uh, top to them. And these in particular uh, both pivot, which makes it a lot easier to get the collar on. Uh, if you can't put it all on before you get the shirt on, you can slide the, uh, the stud with the top pivoted up into the buttonhole at the back, leave it out. And then when you put the collar on, you just slide it over that and then flip it up. And that's, I, I love the duckbill style because that, that keeps your collar exactly where it needs to be. It's also very easy to slide it on. And that's what it looks like from the back. That's the exact same shirt, exact same collar. And in this case, um, the shirt collar, it's just a band style. But at the very back in the middle, there's a buttonhole on the outer layer of the collar. And where it would normally be stitched at the bottom, that's left open. So it's where they where they had folded down the collar to make the band. They just left that outer piece open at the back so you could slide that um, stud up in place. Now, some just have the hole all the way through, but then you've got that stud rubbing against the back of your neck. And that's not comfortable. Trust me. So 
that deals with your all of your cufflinks and the different styles of shirt and collar studs that you'll run across. Now, you could try to use the shirt studs as cufflinks. Um, they do work, kind of. Um, the collar front type stud works as both a you know front of the shirt, and it would also theoretically hold your uh, cuff together, but they fall out really easily. And the uh, uh, pipe stem style do not stay in as a cufflink. You can try all you want. It's not going to stay there. It's just, it's too easy for it to just slip right out. Now, your cuffs, I don't, I meant to take a picture of this and show it. Your cuffs were actually held on with a cuff holder or a separate stud to hold the cuff to the shirt, then the cuff itself would be closed with the cuff links. And that's another thing that people get confused. But we still have tie stuff to go. So I'll stop here to see if anybody has any questions before I keep plowing forward. I should have stopped after the cuff links, but I just kept going. So if anybody has a question while I hydrate. Hello, Alice. So uh, the first question, why are the collars and cuffs separate? So you had about 100 years where um, it started in 1825, uh, no, 24. Um, the wife of a blacksmith in Troy, New York, whose name was Hannah Lord Montague, got very, very tired of having to wash the entire shirt when all that you saw was the collar and the cuffs. Everyone wore jackets all the time. They wore waistcoats, they wore jackets. Being in your shirt sleeves like this was considered underwear. So in order to make things easier for herself, she grabbed some scissors and cut off the collar, cut off the cuffs and washed them separately and then stitched them back on. In 1924, she got the patent for detachable collars and detachable cuffs held in place with studs. Standard for about 100 years until both your laundry technology and the um, manu shirt manufacturing technology got better. Now, for a while, they would sell your uh you know your cloth shirts with separate cloth collars so you could still use all of your stiff ones and the stiff ones came in various types there was celluloid there was uh, a linen there was uh, basically paper cardboardish ones that were coated um just a ridiculous amount of of styles because everybody wanted to to come up with the you know the better mousetrap the better collar so um, you stop seeing those after the First World War, really. I mean, they were still worn up through the 20s, but by the 30s, you really didn't find them for sale anymore. And it was just easier to have it all in one. Now, most of the time you would get them, uh, the shirts would have attached cuffs, but not the collars. But um, it just, it, it was that one point in time where it was much easier to uh, handle uh, the laundry that way. Because those were the visible pieces. And it's echoed in the, uh, the modern colored shirts with the white uh, cuffs and collars, the kind of Wall Street look. And that's, that's where that came from comes from is that they're mimicking 
the look of a detachable collar and a detachable pair of cuffs. And then the um, wh why they are so pricey is because they're basically considered a luxury item because you don't need them for day to day. Most of your shirts now are buttoned. And you kind of have to go out of your way to find French cuff shirts. Now, I buy in lots off eBay and from estate sales and things like that. You can find really, really good deals if you just keep an eye out there. Um, particularly if you have something you're, you're wanting, a, a style, you just keep an eye out and uh, you'll find them. It's just, I'm, you know, my prices might be a little high, but uh, I tend to do the, the grunt work and um, the research, and that, um, that takes a lot of my time. So, um, regular modern cufflinks, you should be able to get them at like $20, $25. I mean, most of your department stores in the menswear section will have one tiny little stand that will have like uh, Jeffrey Bean or, you know, some modern brand uh, name cufflinks. And a lot of those are still made by companies like Swank. They're just not putting their logo on them. They're putting on the logo of the uh, uh, large company that's purchased them. But um, and then if you look in uh, thrift stores, antique malls, things like that, you can find some really nice ones at 10, 10 to twenty dollars. I'm often surprised at some of the ones I've I've been able to find at some really good prices, and then later on find out just how much they're actually worth because they're so rare. But that's why I enjoy uh, doing those circuits. Uh, any other cufflink questions before we head on? Exposition always makes me thirsty. Well, I'll go ahead and charge ahead. If um, if there are any questions, uh, just uh, chime in. So, oh, I gotta go back over here. So the first standard tie item is the tie clip. And these just clip across the uh, tie to hold it, uh, both the shirt and the tie to hold them together. But it's, it's to keep your tie from flipping up and hitting you in the face. So it's if you're wearing a jacket, you can wear it higher because then it's more a piece of jewelry. But if you're not wearing a jacket, shirt, and that way if the wind comes up, it's going to keep it from hitting you in the face. But the, the, um, uh, the, this clip is the style you will find most often these days. Now, because they assume everyone is right-handed, they are all put across the tie from the right-hand side. So if you see things with the writing on them or an image, it's obvious, oh, yeah, this is the, you know, the right side up, so it goes across this way. If it's an abstract design, you may not know, but they're all supposed to go across the right. Now, on the right-hand side, the two smaller ones... Um, are both Victorian and they don't go all the way across the tie like the modern ones do. It's, it's harder to see and I can't remember if I did a second. Nope. Um, but where the, the hinge is for the clip is about halfway across rather than having that curved edge before you get the clamp. Um, so it fits farther across the top. That's how you can tell uh, a much earlier uh, Victorian or Edwardian tie clip is that they're both smaller 
and the hinge is in a completely different spot. And the, the horse whip, I can't believe we still have that. With the number of Sherlock shows we've done, it's still in our collection. But that's a true Victorian uh, horse whip tie clip. Now, the question about uh, brands you should look for, particularly with cufflinks and with with tie items, because they all basically made all the same stuff. The biggies are Swank, Anson, Hickok, and there's Chrysler and Kremitz, and both of those are very high end. Swank has all manner across. Uh, both Anson and Hickok are a little. Uh, they're not as high end as say the Chryslers, um, but those are those are the big names. If you go looking at lots of cufflinks, you'll see those. There's also Dante. There's a Senator line. Um, you know, there were a ton of people actually making them, but those that you see most often were the the better quality ones that are still around, and that's the Swanks, the Hickoks, the Chryslers. And uh, let's see next. So just showing the different styles of uh, high items from a, a Swank ad. And I think this was out of Esquire. And so it's got all different manner of your tie stuff. Plus, there's a cuff link that matches one of the tie clips. You've got tie pins that go straight through the tie. You've got a collar pin up at the top that holds the collar together. And we'll talk about those a little later. Now, this is also 50s, maybe early 60s. Because the, the tie is kind of thin, but the tie clips are also small. They're not meant to go all the way across the tie. Now, the way you date neckties is not by the width, it's by the length. People wore waistcoats. They wore jackets all the time. You also had your pants waistline much higher. So your ties were shorter. And then as they stopped wearing waistcoats, as the um, trousers got more on the natural hip, the ties got longer to keep up with that. If you're wearing a tie properly uh, today, the tip of the large end of the tie should be right there at the top of the belt buckle or the, the center of the trousers. It shouldn't be longer than that. You can tuck it in if you want. If it, if it you know, if it's a really long tie and you can't the shirt you're wearing, it's it's perfectly fine to tuck it in. It's perfectly fine to have the thin end on the outside. Um, it's your tie. Wear it however you want. You know, there are ways that people traditionally wear them, but that doesn't mean you have to wear them exactly that way. There's thousands of different styles of knots. Wear what you like. Simple as that. But just back to the, the dating of the ties, within different time periods, they've gotten really wide and really thin. Back in the teens and 20s, they were actually really wide. And part of the function of that tie clip was to hold it all together. You get up to the 80s when you have the really wide ties again. And some of your... Um, tie clips you can date due to the width just because only 70s and 80s would have had ties that wide. particularly if it's trying to go either all the way across the tie or mostly across the tie to hold it in place so next we have the tie slides and instead of 
the the clip to hold it in place these just slide straight across the tie with the inner piece going into the shirt placket to hold everything in place now these can also be used as money clips and i've often seen them sold as money clips when people don't understand that normally your money clips are a lot thicker but i've actually seen a brand that sold their uh, uh tie slides on a display with fake dollar bills showing that you could use it either to hold your tie in place or to hold your cash um some of these slides actually have a little roller on the the far end to help it go across the tie because otherwise it's fairly tight and it may catch going across then you have your tie pins and this is basically any type of pin that you can use to hold your tie um together and or to your shirt these with the little t-bars that t-bar goes through a buttonhole on your shirt so it keeps the tie from going anywhere they come in all different manner of shape sizes devices i love that old fire engine um the little pearl in the lower left i can't tell you how many pearl uh pins tie pins uh, with all manner of backs on them uh, that's a uh, a masonic pin as well you however you want to use it to hold your tie in place now the only issue with the pins is that it puts a hole in your tie so if you don't want a bunch of holes everywhere you have to put it through the exact same hole every time and that ends up um you know tearing the fabric of that tie over time that hole will just be larger and, and much more obvious and you almost have to wear something there to hide the fact that there's you know now a much uh, a larger opening in the uh, the weave of the tie than than you would normally want and i i have so many pins i think i'm gonna just start selling grab bags of pins because a lot of uh, i get in a lot of logoed items or like very specific event items that i don't know if anybody's specifically going to want them and trying to display them all uh that way lies madness i have you know several hundred that uh, don't match the uh, vintage style i'm going for so I, if people are interested, I just might do that. So the next type of uh, tie thing, this is more jewelry, but it's a chain. And so we've got two different styles shown here. Some are the slide type. And the slide actually... And the tie fits through the chain. So all you see in the front is the chain. Now, the only um, the one difference with the clip one is obviously the clip goes behind the tie, but the bar stays in front. Now, you could um, just clip that to the shirt and have uh, just the chain show on the outside of the tie. But since it's... Um, since the bar itself is decorated you might want to wear that on the outside once again no right way or wrong way to wear it other than the way you want to wear it whatever is comfortable for you that tie is a 1940s tie and it's it's very short but on the inside in addition to the manufacturer's label is a union label and that union label was only used between i want to say it was like 42 and 46 and there's a very very tight time frame 
So things like that are a godsend when you're trying to date items, when you can find a label or a company logo or something. Um, and that gives you a much tighter frame to search in. Oh, pardon. So sorry. But uh, but yeah, that's that's one of my favorite ties that I got for two dollars at uh, a thrift store. I was at an event where someone was selling vintage forties and fifty ties, fifties ties, and they were twenty five dollars each, or five for a hundred. I got seven ties at this one uh antique mall uh seven ties for ten dollars and that was one of those ties now one of them is chewed on the side where someone wore a tie clip i guess every single time they wore the tie so there's a very obviously chewed bit on it but it's from the same time frame and uh i see deals like that and i got to dive on now in this case i love the tie so i'm not going to turn around and sell it i just can't but now i know where to to go to look for that sort of thing so here's another magazine ad showing a swank cravat chain being used and if you notice it is on that lower third of the tie this point he would have worn you know he's wearing a jacket but the jacket would have been open uh no waistcoat and i can't remember Hey, everybody. Looks like we've got some technical difficulties going on right now. Uh, oh, wait. Here's Jason. He's back. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. Let me um, get our presentation back. There we go. So I don't know how much of my talking about this you got. A uh, magazine ad from the 50s, Swank, uh, demonstrating their cravat chain. And those have been worn since, I think, the 30s. You know, once again, it's I'm, I'll need to go dig up the uh, patent to see when they were first manufactured. So let's see. Next slide is the wraparound, uh, I guess you'd call it a tie bar. It's kind of a clip. But uh, these are the items like the, the swords and the arrows and stuff like that. And basically, they wrap around from the back uh, to look like the item has pierced the tie. Now, the... Uh, the arrow was the first one that uh, they came out with, but you see a lot of the swords more often these days. Um, the images on the right are looking down on those three, and you see the little curved uh, clip on the back. That's what slides into the placket on your shirt. And then the rest of the tie fits in the. Uh, the two halves of the sword or arrow or whatever. Now the arrow, that one flips out. The others you have to slide, you know, you slide the uh, tie into the long end first and then shift it so you can put the short end around. Um, it's pretty easy to do, but it's not as simple as just flipping it open, tying your tie and then flipping it closed. So here's those three on a tie, which is another period uh, piece of neck where I love. And then there's a magazine ad showing Swank's daggers through the tie. 
and depending on how where it sits on the tie you can get uh, a fairly thick uh, pucker there so it really does look like it's stabbed all the way through let's see swap back over to comments I have a ton of these swords and a bunch of arrows, and I will try to get them online as, as soon as I can. Um, I have just the one rapier. Everything else I have is a long sword, and those have different colors on the hilts. More often than not, you'll find the white, but I've got some reds and some uh, blues as well that are really pretty striking. So if you're interested, hit me up later and I can send you uh, pictures of everything I've got. So let's see, next slide. Oop. Helps if I have my proper window highlighted. So this is the original patent for that arrow sliding uh, tie item and if you notice there's an arrow there's a nail um, it shows the different types the different methods of uh, how the tie would fit in those items and uh, it was assigned to swank and that was 1950 i think I am not wearing my glasses. But the uh, VT uh, Howard, Viola T. Howard, it's designed by a woman. And she has a ton of patents under her name. It's well worth looking that up. Because you think of most of this stuff as being Guyland, because it's men that are going to wear them. But uh, no, she. And this is one of the ways I was able to date the uh, the sliding items. They were never made before 1950. So they're 50s and 60s items. And I think some are still made today for uh, Shriners, uh, different fraternal organizations. Um, I've, we've got a lot of scimitars as well, and those are particularly for the uh, the shrine folks. So let's see next. Okay, collar stays. Now, when you're wearing a straight collar shirt, if they're not built in, there are those channels on the inside like you see on the right. When you buy a shirt, they'll probably have a flimsy plastic version of these in it. That keeps your shirt collar stiff and straight it doesn't curl it doesn't you know bend up uh it just makes everything nice and and clean looking so you want to throw the plastic ones away and you want to get metal ones now the, they have metal and then they have much higher priced bone uh, uh stays they come in a bunch of different uh sizes because your collars are going to be different lengths, different widths. Your uh, wider collars are going to be much shorter. So you'll need a shorter uh, collar stay. They actually have some that adjust. They've got little holes in them. And you can make them longer. You can make them shorter. And uh, But I just wanted to show that's how they go in. And then you'd flip it down. Now, the next item is the collar pin. And there's a couple of different styles. There's the clips. And those actually just clip on each end of the tie. Or in the, they clip on each end of the collar underneath the tie. Your tie sits above that. It gives that pinched in look at the collar. It holds the knot up and in place. And it's a nice, really polished, professional look. You don't necessarily see the front of the pin because that's where the tie is. 
So the other two types are slides and your barbells. Your slides are on the left, and those just slide on each side of the collar. You'll want the, the longer, more straighter edged collars. Like um, Goodfellas, you know, the gangster types. Um, those 70s style, longer pointed collars. Your more modern wide ones, there's just no point. It doesn't fit. Uh, the, let's see, the third from the bottom, kind of in the middle there, that one actually expands. It slides out, slides in. So it works with different type of um, collars. The ones on the right are the barbell style. Either end unscrews, and there's a little sharp point. And so you're supposed to poke that through each piece of collar and then screw it together so that sits underneath you know, the knot and holds it all together. The problem with those is that it leaves a hole in your shirt unless you're buying shirts that specifically have holes made for those. And when you're getting shirts made, you can request, I need the, uh, the barbell holes in the collar. And then the one at the bottom um, actually has another chain, and that would rest across the knot of the tie rather than further down on the body. And this shows how your collar pin would be worn. Unfortunately, this particular collar was, was uh, fairly short. Uh, I couldn't find a really long collar, but uh, that shows you what it looks like. That you see a little bit of it on each side of the knot, but it holds the knot up. It provides that kind of roll at the collar. And then um, that's one of the clip or the slide styles. Sorry. All of those clips I have were way too short. And then that's just a. Um, a standard black knit tie. That's what um, uh, Connery wore as uh, Bond. He wore a lot of those knit ties. And they're, um, uh, it's just a really neat look. And what do I have next? Nothing. I'm done. Because I think I have about, oh, Less than three minutes, I'm, I guess, over my time. But uh, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Hopefully, you will now be able to tell different men's accessories apart when you run across them. Um, if you ever have any questions, uh, I'm just jason at blackbirdfinery.com. Uh, I've got a bunch of, you know, I'm Blackbird Finery on all of your various social medias. Um, I do have a web store. Um, I'm slowly trying to get items up there. I need to adjust kind of the pricing, but there's a special code uh, that's only active this weekend that'll get you 25% off. And I'm actually blanking on what that code is. I'm very sorry about that. But um, I will, uh, I'll make sure it's uh, posted in the, the Facebook group for this, and I'll definitely mention it on, uh, during my next panel on Sunday at, um, I think it's 1230 Eastern, and that's how to be dapper on a dime, and that's all my uh, tips and tricks and hints on uh, how to look like a million dollars without spending. Oh, there we go. I knew it was winter in the woodlands 2020. I'm, I'm hugely original, but uh, that works through the end of the month. And I will be trying to put a lot more items up online. If there are any that you saw during this presentation, let me know and I'll make those available uh, with the same discount. I can either just you know, load it up onto the website and uh, have it uh, set aside for anyone who asks. But I guess I need to go because y'all have 
other stuff to do tonight. And, but I really appreciate everybody hanging out. I hope you had a good time. And I will see y'all later.